Welcome to the Strength Coach Experience Podcast. Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Lego. Your host. And here we and here we go, go, go. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Strength Coach Experience, episode 23. Uh, today, I want to welcome Rachel Balkovic, who is the New York Yankees minor league hitting coach. And also, she's currently with the Sydney Blue Sox in Australia. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm happy uh, to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I'm excited to get going. Awesome. Uh, so why don't we just jump right in? Why don't we just talk about a little bit about growing up and your background and, and kind of how you got into coaching and everything else? Um, yeah, uh, it's a long story, but long story short, I guess. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, um, moved away pretty early when I was a sophomore in college. So I went to uh, Creighton University originally to play softball, and then I transferred and went to the University of New Mexico. Finished up a bachelor's degree in exercise science there. Um, went on to, well, again, like long story short, did a few internships, went on to be a graduate assistant shit at, uh, graduate assistant at LSU. Uh, so I was a strength and conditioning coach there for two years, um, got my master's degree in sports administration, worked with six, seven different teams there. I was pretty fortunate. I think nowadays people are specialized in one sport, but at the time I was able to do baseball, softball. Uh, I was over men's and women's tennis and then also was able to work with volleyball and women's basketball as well. So kind of just a lot of different sports, which I think um, people underestimate not really for the, um, not necessarily for the, uh, actual exercises, you know, what, what we did differently. Um, but more so you get exposed to six different head coaches, six different athletic trainers, six different assistant coaches, six different cultures, you know, like just little bubbles of culture within each team and seeing how each team operated. And then also how that translated to their success or failures. So um, that was probably, that was one of the most impactful experiences still in my career and definitely was, was wildly helpful early on for me as a strength coach. Um, from there, went on, did an internship for the St. Louis Cardinals. At the time, um, there was still a lot of like seasonal internships going on at the rookie level with strength and conditioning and professional baseball. So I was able to get one of those seasonal internships. Did that at Johnson for the Johnson City Cardinals, RIP. They're gone, I think. Um, oh, they are no more. <laughs> yeah. So did that with the Johnson City Cardinals. And then the next year uh, got pretty rocky. I was out of baseball for a full season and then uh, was able to return as the minor league strength and conditioning coordinator for the Cardinals after a year of being out of baseball. Did, again, a couple more internships along the way. Los Tigres, Daily Say, Chicago White Sox in the Arizona Fall League, Arizona State, baseball and softball. Um, and then was hired full-time by the Cardinals 2014. Was their minor league strength and conditioning coordinator for two years. Uh, then after that, I was with the Astros for three seasons, Latin American strength and conditioning coordinator, um, and also a double-A strength coach, went back to school. I'm making this really short. Uh, went back to school, got a second master's degree, um, which I didn't finish, which I could talk about, but ended up doing research at Driveline for six months and eye tracking for hitters. Was hired by the New York Yankees while I was at Driveline as a minor league hitting coach. And as you all know, this season was canceled. And so I'm, I am now currently in Sydney, basically getting hands-on experience as a coach and just kind of, um, was searching for any opportunity to advance my career, get that hands-on experience during the winter, during the off season, and then headed to spring training in about a month, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, with the Yankees as a minor league hitting coach. Awesome. A lot of experience, you know, a uh, great story. I just want to go back to what you said with the experience early on with the culture. Uh, I do think that's extremely important. Uh, like you, you know, I did the same thing. I went through the college uh, setting, but when I was there, you know, one strike coach and me. So I got that uh, same experience of doing seven, eight teams. And I think that's kind of a lost art. As you said, everybody just comes yes. out and I want to do football or I want to do baseball. And when you get to do those seven teams, you're right, there's a culture. Every team acts different as a group. They all respond differently to things. And I think it really helps you uh, learn to deal with, you know, the different types of athletes there are, even if you go into a yeah. specific sport. So I think that's awesome that you brought up the culture. Um, I mean, that's, I probably spend more time thinking about culture than I do about, I know, not probably, 1,000 million percent, I spend more time thinking about 
culture and the intangibles and the nuances of, of communication, I guess you could call it, um, than I do about exercises. You know, I think at LSU, and just to touch on that a little further, is, you know, Coach Moffitt literally, Coach Moffitt was the head strength and conditioning coach. He would pass out LSU's strength program to like anyone. Like if you emailed him today, I don't know if he still does this, but if you emailed him today and just said, hey, what do you guys do? He might just email you the entire strength and conditioning program. And I always thought that was very, it has always stuck with me because he was like, cool, here's our program. You can't coach like us. And so, and your, and your standards aren't as high as ours. So cool, do the exercises however you want to do them. But that's not what makes our program special. And I bring that up over and over again because there's so much like secrecy, you know, surrounding everything. And I'll tell even my boss now, I'll be like, Dylan, we can tell them everything we're doing. It doesn't matter. We, it, that people aren't going to implement it to the level of standards that we do. They don't have the coaches that we have. They don't have the players that we have. So it doesn't matter, you know. And so there's this huge level of secrecy, which I think is funny. Um, it's funny because like, that's not really ever the secret sauce, but uh, it's the tangible thing that you can put your hand. Oh, this is the program. These are the sets of reps. These are the exercises, et cetera. But that's like, that's the least important part in my opinion. So at LSU, the thing that I really learned was championship culture. I mean, you got to think at the time, so it's 2010 to 2012. And during that time, the football team was in the national championship. Uh, baseball and softball were both in the college world series, women basketball, women's basketball, sweet 16, uh, men's tennis that I was directly over was top 25, knocked off some top 10 teams. Like people were winning. And so when I give advice to people who are starting out their careers, whether it be in strength and conditioning or hitting or pitching or whatever, I always say, go to the college level where winning matters and try to be mentored under a winning program. So you can see what it means to day in and day out have extremely high level standards and a lot of pressure. Like if, you, if you've if you never felt the feeling of win or lose your job, and by the way, I haven't even personally felt that because I, I was under people who felt that, let's put it that way. I was under people who felt that. But if you've never felt win or lose your job, in my opinion, you've never felt coaching. Because if you're, if there is no accountability for you as a coach to actually improve somebody, then what are you really doing? So when you look at professional baseball, I'm going on a tangent, but hopefully this helps somebody out there. When you look at professional baseball and the structure of professional baseball in the minor league system, wins do not matter. And yeah, you can say, well, we, you know, development matters and such, but like you are not winning to keep your job at all. You could go through 10 years of your career as a minor league strength and conditioning coach or a minor league coach, period, and never feel pressure to win, which means every minute, like in, in college, it's like seconds and minutes matter in a literal sense because of the time constraint, because the NCAA and the time constraints. In a literal sense, seconds and minutes and words, every word out of your mouth and every action that you do as a coach matters to creating your culture and developing players and winning. But in the professional level, especially with the way that baseball is structured, it doesn't. In the NFL, maybe yes, because you get drafted and go straight to the NFL. But in the NBA, maybe yes, too. But really in professional baseball, that gets watered down because the, the developmental system is so extensive. Yeah, I think that's an awesome point. Uh, when I was in the minor leagues with the Mets, the same thing. You know, everybody asks what the difference is between college and professional. It's that winning culture you bring up. You know, there is you know, there is not a lot of incentive to win because that doesn't affect the individual player, you know, and all the individual players are trying to move up and move up levels and obviously get to the big leagues. And when you have a team, you know, they could be 30 and 0, but you, you start to kind of feel that lose itself a lot of the times because that winning culture isn't there. So I think that's awesome. Bring it up, you know, anybody out there listening, get into a winning culture and, and use that as your experience, because like you, like she said, there is, you know, the seconds, the minutes, everything counts. Uh, and I just want to go back to what you said before too, because I've talked about it on the podcast, we're giving out your program. You know, there's this whole secrecy thing among strength conditioning, among sports science. And, and I don't like it either because, you know, everybody acts like they can't tell somebody anything. And I think that limits us with information, you know, especially with oh, the, it's so funny. You know, yeah, the involvement. You're like, of oh, media. we can't tell people we're trap bar deadlifting. It's like it's not a secret. That's not a secret. <laughs> no. Nope. Like, oh, you're using a barbell. There's not. It's not a secret. Now, if you've got proprietary 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 information 
analytics, different algorithms that you're using to evaluate players that are truly unique to your organization, fine. But the whole secrecy thing is just funny. It's funny. I'm like, you're not, it's not rocket science. What's rocket science is hiring the right people, um, scouting the right players. And I don't mean right like their talent. I mean, like people who are going to fit into your organization. I mean, yeah, it's just fun. The secrecy thing is, is makes, it makes me laugh actually. Yeah, no, I mean, it's happened all around, like I said, and we all use the same stuff. You know, I trap our deadlift. Everybody uses the same thing. The exercises aren't, it's, nobody has a secret book with some special exercise. And I think they're, that's an easy way to say, oh yeah, my program's the best. What do you do? Oh, I can't tell you. You know, instead of what you said, the, the culture is what makes it. You could have the simplest program if you bring in people that fit together. If you bring coaches that understand each aspect of every player and can carry and marry all that together and you get your players to run through a wall for you, uh, you know, there's no stopping you regardless of the program. And I think, you know, with social media, you know, everybody puts the programs up there, right? And it's, oh, you know, Cressy put up, you know, a program. Uh, you know, I have his program now. I'm going to do all this. And I'm like, that's not the point. He could give you his entire thing. If you, you're not going to run it like him because the culture of, you know, his performance place and what he does isn't the same. And I think that's, you know, across the board with every, every strength coach out there. Mm -hmm. So let's just go into a little bit. When you started, uh, you know, athletics in high school and college, um, were you always like into practice, into working out and stuff like that? Were you always the type of person that was, you know, in the gym and stuff after practice? Yeah, I would say since I was 11, actually. It's just, um, I think that people see, you know, the public or whatever the industry sees uh, me getting hired, you know, whether that was as a strength and conditioning coach or as a hitting coach now, and people are, surprised or they've got stuff to say about it negative or positive and I just think like my family and my teammates from when I was young and even my college teammates are not surprised you know they mm -hmm. might be like oh wow yeah hitting coach but they're like yep that makes sense that would be what Rachel would do and that Rachel is the person that would do that and so I was always from a very young age I went to the gym with my dad probably just to hang out with my dad you know but it ended up being a a habit of mine and especially as I got into more competitive sports by the time I could drive I was going to the gym three times a week as a 16 year old girl by the way in 2003 wow. so like that's that was it's unheard of now even for young women to be training but it definitely was unheard of when I was doing it and so I had developed that habit really early from my dad and then just carried over into as soon as I got to college and I had a weight room at my disposal and coaches that were teaching me how to do things um, I def right away, I was like exercise science, wanted to write my own programs, was training like a mad person, uh, definitely overtraining probably at some points and just, um, just testing it out. And so I was always a, a gym rat, really took to it. Uh, and frankly, because I had a lackluster career on field, I think it was a place for me to feel self-worth and feel like I could contribute to the team in some way where I could go into the weight room as one plus one equals two. You go in, you work hard, you will see results. Uh, wasn't so much that way for me with softball where I could work as hard as I wanted to and just wasn't really going to ever pan out for me at the division one level. So um, all those things combined, I had phenomenal strength coaches in college. It just really like fostered me into that, making that a career path. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's important, you know, a lot of strength coaches too, that everybody usually gets into it very young, you know, whether it's on purpose or kind of by accident, but we all kind of end up in the gym early just by, you know, curiosity or whatever. Mm hmm um, so when you went into college and you, you were playing softball and stuff, were you involved in the coaching aspect right away too? Uh, you know, when you got in there, were you talking to the strength coaches and, you know, going over programs and things like that? Um, you mean uh, like, and also hitting the, everything? Yeah. Like when around. you, yeah, yeah. When you were like, when you were, when in college, like when you first got there, uh, you know, when you would go into lifts and stuff, were you trying to better your knowledge in the strength field and stuff as you, oh, as yeah, an athlete? yeah. yeah. So the, the, I mentioned I had great strength coaches. And by that, I mean, like I had uh, really at New Mexico where I kind of, you know, chose the career field and was like, I'm going to be a strength coach. Uh, my strength coach there actually like had his own Olympic weightlifting team and coached Olympic weightlifting and, and just, and competed at it himself. Uh, kind of an older guy. And he would be showing us like, you know, Russian weightlifting videos and stuff. And uh, so he was, phenomenal at teaching the lifts and a phenomenal coach and a true like it was his profession for 30 years and 
I think I just got really great instruction, which anytime you have a great coach, it's like you just, they, they want to teach you. And also obviously like the, the people that work the hardest always get coached the most people that are inquisitive, you know, so I would show up for extra sessions and he was always trying to recruit me to, to compete on his weightlifting team and those things. So um, yeah, I was definitely inquisitive in that way for sure in the weight room, um, which ultimately, I've, you know, led me to being a strength coach. That's, that's why is because I had the opportunity to play at a high level and was, was immersed in this culture where, training you know I think at the division one level uh, especially now you know but we're talking about 10 years ago so actually like relatively speaking I didn't know this at the time but relatively speaking in some ways in baseball and softball that was still a bit of the dark ages for weightlifting so at that time for a woman for a softball player to have access to an extremely high level weightlifting coach was actually very rare I, I don't think people understand that now so yeah, that was hugely impactful and definitely why I became a coach. Yeah, I think that's a great story. And I think, you know, those out there starting out, it's very important, you know, from her story to understand when you start to coach athletes and when you want to get into this, you're changing their lives. You're not just doing the things in the weight room. You're not just, you know, keeping track of their weights. What you want to do is leave a lasting impact uh, on the athletes, you know, so that either if they get into strength conditioning, you know, they'll always remember you and remember those lessons. Or if they go out onto other things, you want to become a lasting impact. You're changing their life. That's why it's so important to make sure the background knowledge and different things, because we're not just coaches on the field. Uh, you know, we're, we're there to kind of help them with, with all facets of life. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about uh, how did you end up getting into uh, transitioning into hitting from the strength conditioning realm? Um, so even, so as a strength coach, even as a young person, I would, I was always like trying to, I'm a generalist, you know, I'm, I'm a generalist through and through in every part of my life, you know, so I like to get a full picture of what's going on and not specialize in one little area. And so even as a strength coach, I was always, I mean, from the get go in professional baseball, especially I was going in and sitting in on the bullpens. I was sitting in on cage sessions. Like anytime I had a free spot in my schedule, I was trying to attend meetings from different departments. Um, and so really I just naturally being myself, when I got with the Houston Astros, I would look at my schedule. And if I had 30 minutes, I wasn't necessarily sitting in the office reading another strength and conditioning article. I was popping into other meetings. And that could have been scouting, it could have been English classes for the Latin players, it could have been hitting, pitching. I mean, I was all over the place, probably to the annoyance of my bosses sometimes. They're like, where's Rachel? Um, so one of those meetings, I'll never forget, 2016, I uh, went to a hitting meeting about pitch recognition, and I just popped in. It was a dark room. They were showing videos of, of pitchers and cutting the video off at ball release. So the hitters were to see wrist position, you know, fingers, et cetera, and calling out what pitch it was or writing it down, basically taking tests and quizzing themselves on their pitch recognition with these videos. And my mind was just blown. I was like, how did I play softball at the division one level? I didn't even think about how important this is. So from that point forward, um, the guy who was running those meetings was Dylan Lawson. He was a minor league hitting coach with the Astros. He's now my boss with the Yankees. Um, I guess I, you could just say it was a snowball effect of just like little by little, just this momentum building. Um, so that was me learning more and more about the hitting side of the game. Obviously, I'm not unfamiliar with hitting being a softball player, but that was me, the beginnings of me learning more about hitting. Um, and then also, I just at some point when I was with the Astros, decided that I wanted to be a general manager. And so if you, I worked backwards and said, all right, I want to be a general manager. How do I want to craft my career from this point forward? And I knew that I had to leave strength and conditioning. So the question was scouting, hitting, pitching, you know, where, where was my next step? And ended up being that I left the Astros, went back to school in Amsterdam, got a second master's degree, which I didn't finish again. I can talk, talk about that. But anyway, so got a second master's degree. Um, Spent a year in Amsterdam doing coursework, spent six months at Driveline doing research and eye tracking for hitters, which was molded by Dylan, my current boss. So we kind of joke that I'm his Frankenstein hitting coach. Like he basically put me together, you know, and, and, and now he says that he created a monster, you know, but he kind of put me together as a hitting coach and guided me and told me what I should do with my research, what articles I should be reading, um, who I should connect with, those things. And 
Here I am. So I think again, outside looking in, it probably looks like how the hell did that happen? You know, like how did that go down? But if you know the backstory of how I've known Dylan now for I think five years and he's the one who mentored me directly probably the most in hitting. Um, and so, yeah, no surprise that he hired me. Also important to know, especially for strength coaches, um, Dylan has a master's degree in exercise science. Uh, and so did his boss, Jeff Albert, with the Astros, who's now a major league hitting coach for the, the, the Cardinals. But they have strength and conditioning backgrounds. So Jeff was the hitting coordinator for the Astros. He hired as many people as possible with strength and conditioning backgrounds, or at least education, understanding the body, as hitting coaches. So there was a real, it was a really smooth conversation between the hitting coaches and myself uh, when we were talking about hitting because they saw it from a mechanics, a, a true mechanics perspective, not just, oh, this is my opinion, this is how I used to hit, this is how I did it, but like a true, how does the body work using terms like hinge, using terms like rotation um, that we use in the weight room all the time. Yeah, I think that's uh, awesome, you know, that you just, the, the thirst for knowledge kind of uh, ended you up in hitting, you know, because you wanted to uh, see the other facets of baseball and not just be in the weight room and, and understand the movements. Also, I think you bring up a great point how, you know, the new turn should be that everybody should have that knowledge and strength conditioning, because then we can have those conversations with the hitting coaches, with the pitching coaches, so that we're all on the same page, you know, because I know when I was in the Mets, uh, you know, in 2014, it was like, the, you know, the skills guys were on one side of the place and we were on the other and it was a constant battle, uh, you know, to try to explain to them what we were doing or, you know, kind of what was going on. And then you have that age old question. You have an older pitching coach who thought strength and conditioning was nonsense. And I mean, one of ours said they should put a lock on that weight room door and, you know, they shouldn't go in there because that's how they get injured, you know? So I think that marrying of the, of the two is extremely important for the, you know, for the teams and for the sport to progress. Because like I said, we, we should be banging heads. We should, everybody should get along kind of on the same, yeah. same page. And unfortunately, I would say that that's like, that's still, I mean, I think in some, in some places that has changed, in some places that is still actually the norm. And it's part of why I left strength and conditioning, to be honest with you. I just got tired of like arguing with people. And so now it's funny, I kind of joke, but it's true. Now as a hitting coach, I have actually more impact on strength and conditioning than I ever did as a strength coach. Because now, if for some reason I think a guy needs to gain 20 pounds, I can just walk right in the weight room and say, hey, strength coach, <laughs> this guy needs to gain 20 pounds. And hopefully any strength and conditioning coach is like, hell yes, thank God there's a coach that wants me to train somebody, really push them and train them. And guess what? I even think if they were to, for some reason, unfortunately, if they were to get injured in the weight room training, I would say, well, that's the risk we take if we think that strength and conditioning truly has a purpose. It's the risk we, we take that during that training, just like if they were to swing and tear their oblique, it's training. And all of those things are getting them better. And so, you know, now as a hitting coach within, just like that, all of a sudden I have more say in an athlete's strength and conditioning development than I ever did as a strength coach. Uh, something to keep in mind out there for you strength coaches if you're ever considering switching over to, or if you have the opportunity to switch over, I highly recommend it. And I now view strength and conditioning as more of a um, stepping stone actually for skill coaches, because I think having that background in the body is wildly important. Um, but as far as the actual career of strength and conditioning, your ceiling is much lower than if you're a skill coach um, or even management, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely agree. Uh, because, you know, when, when you're in there in the weight room, you know, your opinion sometimes doesn't have as much weight. And then if you can uh, get into the skills realm, like I said, you have more abilities to change the mind. Plus, they, I think they trust you a little bit more uh, because you're on the sports skill side. But I think that's a great uh, thing. I mean, I think it's going to change. I think Cochran from Alabama just uh, went over and I think he's a skills coach at Georgia now, I believe. So, whoa, um, I didn't see that. Yeah, Big yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that I think that happened, I think last year, I believe, and I heard it. I'm like, oh whoa. my God. Yeah, I, I don't was know like, why, how I missed that. Okay. Yeah, I was like, something, something's going to change because I talked to somebody about it and they were like, do you know, he quit and he went to as a skills coach. And I'm like, uh oh, that's going to, that's kind of the top of the thing. And it's going to start to, I think, go down because for him oh, to do that happen. in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And it should. I, I, I tell, I hate to say this and I'll just say it on the, I'll start saying this more on podcasts, but like strength coaches leave strength and conditioning. 
it the the career field itself you would like to, i would like to th say that after 10 years i could say yeah the career field has progressed but i'm just not sure that it has and it's not that we haven't gotten better by the way it's not that strength coaches haven't gotten better haven't gotten more educated haven't spent more money on their education because now it's basically the prerequisite to have a master's degree if you want a full-time job but the actual the actual ability of a strength coach to make an impact on a culture and i'm I, if you ask cochran I'm guessing that's what he might say is that he probably has more impact on the culture decisions. You're involved in more meetings. You're involved in more high level meetings. You're involved in just a lot more things when you are a skill coach. Um, and even then it's like, you know, I said, my, my goal is to be a general manager. So even then it's not, you know, still as a skill coach, you're relying on the farm director, the GM, the assistant GM, the special assistant to the GM, the co-farm director, the co, the assistant to the assistant to the assistant co-farm <laughs> director. You know, you're, it's like there's 10 people in line that are still making decisions that directly impact your ability to do your job. So yeah, when you're the strength coach, and I know there are strength coaches out there, they're going to laugh when I say this. When you're a strength coach, the athletic trainer is your boss. The hitting coach is your boss. The pitching coach is your boss. The manager is your boss. The nutritionist is your boss. The clubhouse manager might be your boss. You know, I remember fighting with clubhouse managers about buying healthy food for the players. And they're like, well, I get a tip if I buy Pop-Tarts. And I'm like, well, I, I'm, the, and I'm, I'm the strength coach over here going, okay, I guess we're buying Pop-Tarts. You're my boss. I've got a master's degree and now I've got almost three degrees and you're the clubhouse manager is my boss. But if I'm the farm director, I'm like, no, you're not buying Pop-Tarts. And then that conversation is over. Yeah, I think that's something to bring up. And everybody listening, like I said, they don't tell you that when you first start out. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a strength coach and I'm going to be the guy, you know, I'm going to go in there and control everything. But that's the reality. You know, when you get to those upper levels, you have no power. You know, same thing. My experience with Mets, you're at the bottom of the totem pole. You know, we buy cheese doodles and Nutella and they would just eat garbage. And I'm like, what do we, you know, the clubbies, like you said, they go out, buy fried chicken and French fries for all the guys. And I'm like, because they get we? tipped. Yep, exactly. So I, I think it's a change. You know, you you have to if you want to get into the field now, you know, like Rachel said, do your uh, research. But I agree. Strength coaching is, is going, you know, out the door just at, on its own. You know, private sector maybe still be there. But in terms of those bigger areas, college professional, you have to get another skill or you have to move into another uh, direction because, you know, you're just going to be ignored. I mean, it's like, and I don't want to just be this negative person, but I will say that there, there was a girl the other night, she's a sophomore in college here in Australia. She wants to get into strength and conditioning. She's a part of the national baseball team, national women's baseball team. She's played softball, um, great young resume. And she was asking me about strength and conditioning. And I was like, why don't you be a hitting coach? And she was like, oh, and I was like, yeah you know, get, get your, get your background, which I actually think should be the education for coaching a skill is exercise science. Duh. It's the body. Duh. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, this makes too much sense. So exercise science should be a foundational, you know, probably exercise science and behavioral psychology. Those should be like educational components of any coach of any sport. So I put that in her mind and she was like, Oh yeah. And I was like, yeah, you have more impact than you think. And if you're an educated coach with, with a background in the body and a background in understanding mechanics, that's great. So I think, I, I don't wanna just bash on strength and conditioning because there are certain jobs. I've heard of people who have great experiences, but again, you're at the mercy of, look, if the coach gets fired that supported you, what what is the next coach gonna bring? If the GM gets fired, if the, administrator gets fired like that great little utopian situation that you had could be very temporary so again I think people have had positive experiences but I seem to hear way more negative experiences as a strength and conditioning coach than I hear positive and I don't think that's me just seeking it out I think it's me just being realistic about the situation and then you've got again strength coaches with 30 years of experience get fired because the new person that comes in goes what's a deadlift and you're like oh my god because if you can't evaluate me as a strength coach then where's this job security if i hand a program over i'll never forget never in my life will i forget this experience and and now we could laugh about it so i'll just share it but um the field coordinator for the cardinals um basically was kind of bashing on me in a meeting and i was like 
you don't even know what these exercises are. And he was like, don't you talk to me. I've been in this game 45 years, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I'm telling, I'm fine. That's great. You know that. But I'm like, how can you be bashing these exercises when you couldn't even, if I asked you, you wouldn't know. And so he was like, well, you give me a program and I'll tell you everyone. And so I actually printed out a program and handed it to him. And I said, tell me. And it ended up in a screaming fight between the two of us. But what it actually ended up in is he came in the weight room and I taught him how to do a deadlift. And he was like, oh yeah, I see how that could possibly benefit a hitter. And I'm like, you think? <laughs> I'm like, oh, good idea. <laughs> you know, but the people, basically the people evaluating strength and conditioning typically don't have any idea what they're looking at. So they could look at a program that you spent months, maybe years, maybe a decade of your career accumulating knowledge, accumulating knowledge to create this perfectly designed program and they wouldn't have a clue of what they're looking at which is a really terrifying thing if you're relying on them to evaluate you as a strength coach and by the way hire or fire you yeah i completely agree like i said it's um you know i think by getting into other uh facets and having that background knowledge you talk about it protects you as a with job security you know there is something that we can go into that you know you're going to be able to get a job and have a long career because right now you know with strength conditioning you know you can get hired and fired really fast or the future is is very bleak because we don't know what's going to happen because of those things so by getting that background knowledge like you said you know it's great you need that background knowledge and i think the psychology part is huge you know when you're on the road with the teams when you're with the kids you're their psychological guru you know they're going to come up with you with problems and different things and a lot of times that's going to be more important than the programs and the other things so yeah. I I think it's awesome, you know, just make sure that you're getting that background knowledge. And also, uh, you know, if you want to get in the industry, make sure there's, you know, you can impact in another way and then use your background knowledge and your knowledge of coaching uh, to kind of push you along. Um, so I want to go through what is something you would like to see change in the industry in the next couple of years? In strength and conditioning? Uh, just in with hitting and coaching, like, let's go through, uh, like where you are now with, with, let's talk about like skills coaching and strength conditioning. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we kind of just touched on it, but I would love to see more strength coaches crossing over to skill coaches, number one, but I also would like to see, I think the trend of sports specific training is like, in my opinion, just out of hand, you know, it's just, it's so far to that side of things where I just go wow, man, like we are so into sports specific training that we forget the basics. And also I think in strength and conditioning, there's this weird trend happening where um, it's just shying away from difficult and strenuous performance training for several reasons. One being you're in an organization and the pitching coach doesn't like it, you know, so you go, oh, okay, yeah, like we're gonna no squatting, trap bar deadlifts, short range of motion, um, short range of motion, everything, you know, uh, three sets of 10, three sets of eight, something that's, that's not going to come even close to being able to be blamed on any kind of strain, you know, t mm -hmm. fatigue, like, you know, there, there's that aspect. There's also the private setting where same thing, people are paying a lot of money to come in your facility. They don't want to show up with a strain you know, God forbid. And so there's the industry, I feel like is shifting more and more and more towards um, boutique type of training and away from really difficult strenuous training. And I just anymore see over and over again, people's programs. And I'm like, damn, you know, outside of football, <laughs> mm -hmm. because, because guess what? In football, if you're not training like that, you die, <laughs> yep, you know, you, absolutely. you, you die. Or you can't compete at a high level. Whereas in other, basically any other sport, you got tennis, baseball, golf, volleyball, and any other sport, really, um, you can easily go, oh, well, they don't need to train like that. They're not football players. And it's like, yeah, but wouldn't you want to be the most durable that you can possibly be um, in every way? So are we limiting them by taking that out? Obviously, I'm biased just by the way that I'm talking, but also I think just spending a lot of time again in a college setting and a, an extremely elite level um, championship environment for two years at the early stages of my career 
um, yeah, I think we're limiting them and we're limiting them from a mindset as well. You know, when we say, oh, don't, you don't need to do that. You're a baseball player. It automatically puts in their mind that they're fragile and we discount that. But when I say baseball players shouldn't do this, it, in their mind, it translates to, I'm a baseball player, so I'm fragile and I can't do that training. So I think that shifting, I've been talking about this for years, you know, but getting away from the sports specific training, at least the language of that should be abolished. However, I don't think I'm going to do that and I'm not going to do it with this podcast for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the language is huge. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff with youth athletes and wrote articles about how, you know, you have little kids do corrective exercises and different things and labeling certain things. And I'm always like, you can't do these things because you're telling a seven-year-old kid that they're broken already because they have to go do, you know, this program to fix their abnormalities or something. And it's all about how you present. Just like you said with, I don't do this because I play baseball or baseball players shouldn't lift heavy. You know, you should want to be the best you can be and push your body to the limit, regardless of what you're doing, because that's going to make you better. But I think the labeling is crazy and people don't understand. Like I said, we talked about the psychology, what you say when you tell a kid, you can't do this or you should do this because of something else. You're already limiting that. And then you're losing that mindset if you put them through exercises to kind of help with those things. Yeah. And it's also, it's not just, it is, <sighs> I think that the whole industry has acknowledged, oh, sports specific training is probably not the best, but like we're all, it's like we're, we have to do it to accommodate, like I said, the, the 70 year old pitching coach that hates the barbell for no good reason. You know, the other, just the other day, there's a kid here that is with an organization and he's a really young international science, 17 year old in the prime of his growth, right? Like this is a 17 year old kid and you're like, oh, you just basically put a barbell on his back and he's going to gain 20 pounds. And he showed me his program from a professional organization and his main lift was a racked kettlebell squat. And I'm like, <laughs> for three sets of eight. And I'm like, that is why, you know, that's, that is not, sorry. I don't care who out there is offended by this. That's not training. That's avoiding, that's avoiding an injury. That's avoiding any kind of, that's avoidance period. You know, and this kid who doesn't even, by the way, know anything about strength and conditioning was like, yeah, I don't do this program because I barely even break a sweat when I do it. And I'm like, they're not dumb. And then guess what else? He's like, yeah, I'm going to go to a private facility. And then we wonder why all these kids want to go to a private facility. It's because they're not getting pushed. They're not getting, they're not seeing any results. And then they go to these private facilities who cater to their every wish, want, and need. And we go, why are they going to this private facility? We provided them with this program and it's not even challenging. And this is a 17 year old that doesn't have any background. He just knows it's not hard for him. So I think that that is where I would like to see the shift. However, again, I'm not doing it on this podcast. I'll do it when I'm a general manager. When I'm a general manager, I will hire a football strength and conditioning coach. I think that's, I think that's a good me. idea. Yeah. I don't want somebody who's going to come in and go, oh, well, you know, we can't do this and we can't do this. And this is baseball specific and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. I want you to build the most, the strongest, toughest, hardest working athletes in our entire division and the entire league. And you let us take care of the sports specific training with our skill coaches. But for strength and conditioning, I want the most robust, strongest, most powerful athletes. And I know what type of training gets that done. And it's not a racked kettlebell squat. And by the way, I should mention also, you're talking to someone though who went back to school for biomechanics. I am a movement nerd barefoot, blah, 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 pelvic, left AIC, I can talk all of it, okay? I am wildly in tune with movement to the point where it's like, I, I can't even describe to you how nerdy I am with movements, how Mike Myers and I became friends actually. But it's like, but at the same time, we can't sacrifice performance training and I know they go hand in hand. And by the way, I should mention this kid that, that I mentioned with the program, he has great movement, ass to grass squat and bare feet, overhead movement is great, great movement, great mobility. And he's doing a racked kettlebell squat for his main lift. And that was his hardest day. <laughs> Unacceptable. Yeah, that's crazy. I don't know why uh, they would do that, but you're right. I, I think that that's an, an awesome change because the foundation of strength conditioning should be lifting heavy weights and getting them 
you know, ready for the foundations. And then if we have in place the skills coaches with the biomechanics backgrounds and the anatomy knowledge, they can take care of all the sports specific stuff because they understand how to improve those movements, how to improve the things with the CNS. But I think, yeah, inside the weight room, they just need to be worried about being coming the strongest person they can. And then as we move out into the field, if we have those people in place with the degrees and understanding of biomechanics, they should be able to take care of that stuff. Because if we have that foundation now as a skills coach, I don't have to worry about you getting hurt or little things happen because I know that you've had that base. But like you talked about before, if you're going off to another place and you're getting different training, you know, there is communication there, but there's certain things you don't know. And then as a skills coach who, you know, really understands their craft, it's kind of hard to put them through everything you want to, because you don't really know exactly in every way what they're doing. And they could be doing, you know, that single, single kettlebell rack squat, which is going to be, you know, really hard for you to add more depth to their uh, infield and movement abilities. Mm -hmm. um so what's next in the future uh i know we have covid and everything going crazy but what uh what's next for you uh down the line um i mean this year i'm gonna be a hitting coach <laughs> it's like i mean i was supposed to, it's like mid-year spring training my first year in affiliated ball as a hitting coach and definitely was my you know not new to baseball not new to hitting by any means but obviously that on-field experience is what i need and so it's why i'm in sydney coaching right now um talked with my boss and said, look, I could, you know, I could do a number of things to develop, but I got to go take this opportunity to be hands on working with the same group of guys day in and day out in games, in practice situations, just that, that feeling of the emotional stuff that goes on with guys who are struggling. I mean, just, it's just those intangible conversations you have. And so I came to Sydney to do that. I'll be um, with the Yankees this year as a minor league hitting coach again, hopefully for the first full year. <laughs> yeah. Um, after that, it's up in the air. You know, there's, I think that I have plenty to, to do in the area of hitting, um, but I definitely know that administration is in my future and the front office is in my future. And I've mentioned it a couple of times, but my, you know, one of my long-term goals is to be a general manager. And so there's a couple of things I need to probably tick off before I get there as well and scouting and, and player acquisition. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. Keep it open. Yep, of course, keep it open. Uh, I heard they're going to probably start 154 games, so hopefully uh, they'll get started pretty soon. Yep, hoping. Uh, so, uh, Rachel, for anybody that wants to get a hold of you, ask you some questions, you know, get some insight into kind of your journey, where's the best place to uh, kind of reach you at? Um, I, I definitely am on social media. Uh, Instagram is just rachel.balkovec, but I would say, like, to get a hold of me truly is my website, just rachelbalkovec.com, which you can find on my Instagram. Um, I do mentorships. I do student mentorships. I do career, you know, prof more professional career mentorships. Um, and I also just have kind of blocks of time, like, you know, for like you saw is just blocks yeah. of time where you can book 30 minutes. I, I keep a couple hours open every, every week for that. Uh, that'll probably slow down once baseball gets going in about a month here. Um, but yeah, I do offer those mentorships and try to be accessible, especially for young women, but also do mentorships with young men as well. So I'm, I, I intentionally try to make myself accessible to have conversations with people, whether it's an interview format like this or a more formal mentorship um, for careers. So Awesome. Uh, and when I do put the post up for the podcast, I will uh, tag your Instagram and the website link is in the Instagram too for anybody listening that wants to uh, get a hold of and ask you some questions. Well, thank Great. you, Rachel. I truly appreciate you coming on. It was an awesome conversation and, and I love the insight and, and all the great knowledge. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Great conversation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram for all the latest updates on the podcast.